Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Coffee's ready. We are back at it. Another lovely 16 hour shift. We're gonna have some fun. And we've been having some interesting weather in LA as well. It got to rain a little bit there. So let's go. Come on, let's go have an adventure. Looks like it rained a little bit too. Hopefully it doesn't rain later in the afternoon. One thing I gotta mention here is that we work no matter what kind of weather conditions there are. Sunshine, snow, rain, wind, it doesn't matter. <laughs> These airplanes don't care about weather when they're on the ground. People out in Miami working in humid and rainy conditions all the time. People in New York and Chicago working in extreme cold weather. People in Phoenix, Arizona or Dallas working under blistering sun. But it's gotta get done. Somebody's gotta do the job. I'm fortunate enough to work in LAX. Pretty much almost perfect weather all the time. Well, trust me, I've had my fair share of working very different weather conditions and different stations. I don't ever want to be in Chicago in the middle of February ever again. That was horrible. Let's see now. Here's the first one. Let's go wake it up. Wake it up. What does that mean? Well, majority of these aircraft were overnighted. They stayed overnight. They had maintenance done to them either at the gate or at the hangar. But when the next shift takes over, my shift, day shift, we have to do our preliminary walk arounds. It's just another level of redundancy. We do our usual walk around, inspect the basics, fluids, systems, make sure the aircraft is good to go and dispatchable for the next flight. So most of the time when aircraft are overnighting, either at the gate or sometimes at the hangar, obviously we'll park them and the mechanics have to work on it. So they'll either use APU power or they'll use ground power. Clarification, APU stands for auxiliary power unit, which is basically another turbine at the back of the aircraft. It supplies an air source and an electrical source, but it does need fuel. Or it could be hooked up to jet bridge power, which is the cord that you're seeing right there. Which is this, this is the ground power cord. But time to time, these ground power cords don't really sit properly in the receptacle and they fall out. So to prevent the batteries from draining, I'll show you upstairs. Please note the impeccable coffee holding technique, not a drop spilled. Yes, the thing is glued to my hand and I have a internal stabilizer gyroscope in my wrist. I will never spill a cup of coffee ever. Unless somebody bumps into me. I hate when that happens. We take the batteries offline and just leave the aircraft on ground battery bus. Come on, I'll show you. Okay, first office. Okay, notice the cabin lights are on, but the flight deck is completely dark. So this aircraft is on ground battery bus. So if you look up here, there's a little switch right in there. It's called a maintenance bus or ground bus. It's basically just using ground power just to illuminate the basic light lighting inside the cabin. But what we want to do is kick the airplane on. And remember when I told you earlier, we leave the batteries off just in case that ground power does drop out. You know, the batteries don't drain. So now we can engage the batteries and we kick on because look, it's available right now. Ground power. And here's some ASMR for you. Come alive. <laughs> This is one of our older Airbuses. We call them the basic models. They haven't been equipped with modern things yet. The screens are still CRT, cathode ray tubes. Still got some of the old analog gauges right there. But the internal avionics are up to date. What's that old saying? If it ain't broken, don't fix it. There you go. But the really cool thing about these airplanes is that they are very smart. And when I mean smart, I mean smart. Let's say the batteries are on and the ground power does drop off, right? This airplane is so smart, it's got a battery discharge uh, protection. So in case these batteries drop below, let's see, I believe it was 20, anything below 23 volts for 15 seconds, the batteries will automatically disconnect themselves from the network. So it will, it's a self-protection thing. The airplane will protect itself in case, even if the power does drop off and the batteries are, you know, are left on. 
But then again, you'll get a nice horn as well on the outside, uh, letting you know that the batteries are left on. You see, this is the beauty of aircraft because it's built on redundancy. For every system in the aircraft, there's always a backup system to a backup system. Majority of modern day jetliners that you're seeing have at least a dual or a triple redundant system. Some even go as far as a quadruple redundant system. This also coincides with critical items or critical safety of flight items. So the more critical it is, the more redundancy it has. So for example, if your USB port in your seat is not working, no, there's no redundancy for that. So I'm sorry, you can't charge your phone, but you know, you're still flying. That's the important part, right? But something got to do with navigation, flight controls. These things have multiple computers in there. Just to give you guys a, a, a sense of it or an idea that how, how well it's built. And this is for all aircraft. But that's about it. So yeah, I think, yeah, it is 23, anything below 23 volts for 15 seconds and the batteries will kick off. Actually, oh, quick side note. If anybody's wondering how much power an aircraft generates or requires, well, so majority of aircraft nowadays, the standard is 115 VAC volts, basically, and it runs on 400 Hertz. Now, it can be stepped up and be stepped down as well. There's inverters and converters, as well as transformer rectifiers. They all tie into very individual bus ties and as well as talk to each other. Multiple electrical outputs and inputs. Each engine has its own dedicated generator, the IDGs. You have the APU that has its own generator as well. Some aircraft have RATS, Ram Air Turbines. You also have multiple batteries. Are you starting to notice how complex it's starting to get? These are just the basics. If I start talking about every single one of those individual components, trust me, it will blow your mind. The information for you and obviously the engine generators are off so on to the next airbus all righty okay this is a t model or a transcontinental model notice you'll start noticing that the seat configuration is going to change as we're moving forward a little bit more room less economy seats but wider seats but this is i guess this is they call flagship business very big, very nice, comfortable. I think these are full lay flat down seats. Very nice. And this one has a mid galley. So this is one of the birds that has a mid galley. And this is flagship first class. Bigger pods, also full flat lay down seats. Pretty comfortable. These are more for uh, LA, New York flights, LA, Boston flights. So pretty nice. Very comfortable flight on these ones. If you ever get a chance to fly on this particular model, it's absolutely fantastic. Very comfortable, very spacious. I know my flight attendants that work on these, they love them. From a maintenance perspective, they're a pain because these pods, the way they're designed, oh my goodness, they're horrible to work on. Yes, it looks pretty, it's very comfortable. But again, maintenance perspective. Everything is very hard to reach, especially when you're working in a very tight environment like that. After finishing dispatching the aircraft that were at the gate, we're on to live flights now. On to the next office. And it's going to be a lovely 737-800. I love watching my airplanes pull up. It's beautiful. The sounds, the smell, the beauty. But I also do it in a very strategic manner. I pay attention to the aircraft. I'm looking for damage. I'm looking for leaks. I'm looking at the wheels as they rotate. Attention to detail. So what you just saw there is a very important component. This is the business end of the engine. And that tube that you're looking at it's called the center vent tube. I should correct myself. This is the CFM 56-7B and that little area right there or that exhaust tube is called the plug. Okay, so I made the video of the engines and how they ride on multiple shafts. 
but this is a more of an explanation. The shafts ride on bearings. And what you just saw there spinning was the very last bearing on this engine. It is actually exposed a bit, but that's just the way it's designed. You see, pretty much uh, all gas turbine engines use pressurized seals for their shaft bearings. It keeps the oil in. Well, the result of that is scavenged oil returning to the oil tank via the scavenge pumps. Don't worry, they go through a multitude of filters and chip detectors making sure there's no contamination. But there's also a lot of air that's within these systems. This is why you have these center vent tubes or exhaust ports through the aft portion of the engine. It collects all these gases and vents it overboard. This is more indicative to uh, CFM engines, GE engines. When you take a look at Rolls-Royce engines, they do it a little bit different, but the same concept applies. Anyway, I'm babbling, but my point is it's pretty cool to see the inner workings. You're basically looking at the very last uh, shaft bearing in action. You're, you're seeing it rotate, so I thought it'd be pretty cool to show. Anyway, I'll shut up. Keep on watching. Very nice. All right, she's a good bird. Hydraulics are good. Engine oils are good. With the walk around, all is good. There's a fun one. I probably showed you guys this before. And you'll see this on other model 737s. Usually pilots will have a checklist on these little pads right here, right? But on ours, before I go and explain what I'm explaining right now, a lot of people always have questions on the yoke on the 737. Okay, pay close attention to the right portion of it, right where my index finger is, and you'll see a little number counter right there. A lot of people are always curious about why is that there? Well, that is actually a little number setter. You can rotate that thing around. I'll try to show it to you next time around, but it's basically for flight numbers. Pilots can set the flight number visually so they have a reference of knowing what flight number they're on. That's about it. We don't have them. On ours, we have this. This is the checklist. Pretty cool, huh? For takeoff, for landing. It's just an option that uh, our, our carrier bought. So, pretty cool. I thought, thought I'd show it to you. On to the next one. Next office. Look at that. Turned out to be a beautiful day after all. Schedule is sometimes random, and sometimes I'm just working all narrow bodies, 737s and Airbuses, and sometimes. I'm working non-stop wide bodies, 787s and 777s. But regardless of the metal, it's always fun. I'll let you guys enjoy the beautiful sounds of the V2500 engine pulling in. She's a beauty. This one's actually going to be an ETOPS check. Just came in and it's going to go back out to Kona. So we're going to do our ETOPS check on this. So I think on the last video it was, somebody asked what is an ETOPS check or what is involved in an ETOPS check? What is ETOPS in general? Well, in simple terms, it's a, it stands for extended operations. For aircraft that is flying extended period over water. But I'll explain more. Brand new Neo, too! He's a beauty! So the acronym itself, uh, Extended Range Twin Engine Operation Performance Standards. It's basically a very special rule for twin engine aircraft performing long flights. The standard was set by the IKO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Nowadays, we just shorten it to Extended Operations. But in the more comical sense of maintenance and pilots, we say engines turn or people swim. Once again, a joke, guys. It's just a joke. The Asian humor is fantastic. The whole point of this is understanding how far an aircraft can fly and how far it is in between airports. So if there was some kind of an emergency they needed to land within the long prolonged flight, they have that chance. There's a few weird rules that imply into it, but I'm gonna give you the basics. 
So in the beginning, aircraft were really not allowed to fly beyond 60 minutes away from any kind of other airport. So a 60 minute flight, but you needed to be near a airport so you can land in case of something. But as time progressed, more aircraft are being developed that were more efficient and safety standards also became more efficient. Rules got extended further out. Craft now started to fly 90 minutes between airports and then it became 120. And in recent times, you have aircraft that are flying about 180 minutes between airports. Obviously, these are the big jetliners, the A350s, the, the 777s, the 787s. Now, that's the certification of the aircraft coming from the IKO and the FAA. Not only are you getting the certifications from the governing bodies right there, but the aircraft itself has to be rated for it. That means very particular checks, ETOPS checks, and the internal equipment of the aircraft. So let's go. Okay, so the check, the ETOPS check itself. We're gonna run through it for the narrow body. This is the Airbus A321neo. We know the aircraft is going ETOPS, so now we need to perform the check. Tire pressure, that's a standard. We need to make sure the tire pressure is correct. So we either check it physically right here on the narrow bodies, on the wide bodies, we can utilize the systems from, uh, from the flight deck and check it like that. Once again, back to redundancy, always double checking. These are very particular flights. Domestic flights don't need this. After which, we check the engine oils. We service them up. We make sure it's all topped off. We make sure all the seals are good. We do a full thorough walk around, checking for discrepancies, checking for any kind of damage. One of the important key features of an ETOPS check is we also check the generators, the IDGs, integrated drive generators. We wanna make sure the fluid is correct. Once again, this is a narrow body. It's different on a wide body aircraft because we can look at the parameters from the flight deck. On this particular aircraft, we need to also drop the gear doors because we need to inspect the emergency generator as well. And we get a good look at the wheel well, make sure there's no damage, there's no leakage. It's all part of this particular inspection. As the gear door drops, and it's funny enough, somebody asked me, like, can you drop gear doors when the aircraft is on ground? Yes, absolutely. We can drop the gear doors. This is how we perform maintenance. I'm going to climb on up and I'm going to pause it for a second and explain. This is what I'm looking for, right there. This is the emergency generator. Proper name for it is the constant speed motor generator, CSMG. This thing basically provides power in case of emergency. It's directly tied into the RAT, the Ram Air Turbine. I made a whole separate video for that. Please feel free to go watch it. Why am I checking this? Because this unit is the very last redundancy. This is the quadruple redundancy. Don't get me wrong, I check every other system as well, but we need to check this one just in case. And to note, when you get a nice beautiful view of the Airbus 321neo wheel well, this is where when the gear collapses and goes into the aircraft, this is where it sits. Pretty cool. Along with doing all the tire pressure checks and the systems checks, we also check for brake wear, making sure there's no damage, no obstructions, everything is working in proper condition. It's a lot of attention to detail. What I'm doing there is inspecting the blades very thoroughly. I want to make sure there's no nicks, there's no damage, there's no scratches. No damage whatsoever. Aircraft take a lot of ingestion. Sand, dirt, debris. So we check. Up next come the cargo pits. We check the overall integrity of the cargo pit, starting from the cargo pit netting itself, making sure there's no damage. The floor, the walls, the ceiling, making sure the blowout panels, the pressure panels are okay, making sure the fire suppression system is working and not obstructed, as well as the smoke detectors. Just to mention, this is the aft cargo pit of the 321. So a, a comprehensive and a very visual detailed check of everything. The scuffs and nicks you see there is just from luggage, it's no damage. On this one, we also gotta check the APU physically. Now on the wide bodies, we don't really have to because we can do it through the, the interface of inside the aircraft to check the APU oil. 
But on these narrow bodies, we have to look at it physically. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. I don't make the rules. It is what it is. There you go. Welcome to the APU compartment. It's got its own little light switch, too. Come on. There you go. There it is. Lovely APU. 131-9A. Honeywell. So on these models right there, that's the inlet door. It goes through here. And I open this door. This is the inlet plenum. It goes through here. From here. That's the intake. Kind of awkwardly shaped, right? From the bottom, but that's the way this APU works. Oh uh, yeah. Now, this thing is brand new. Yep. There you go. So it's spotless, pretty clean up here. I'll just do a nice overall visual, make sure everything's okay. And then I'll go upstairs. Along with all the external features and inspections we have to do, we also have to inspect inside. Now, this is a very important and crucial portion of ETOPS certification. If an aircraft that has to be rated to fly extended over water, it also needs to have emergency equipment. Now, on regular domestic flights, aircraft that are not flying extended over water, you won't find as much as equipment like this. But for airplanes like this, that are going very long range, yes, you're gonna find a lot more emergency equipment. Everything from defibrillators, everything from emergency medical kits, a slew of oxygen bottles. Por they call them portable oxygen bottles because they're smaller. And this is what certifies an aircraft like this, not only for its performance and flight, but as well as its emergency equipment. And we inspect it all. I'm sorry guys, I did not get a chance to show you the flight deck and the inspections we perform over there. It's more in the lines of double checking, making sure all the systems are working properly, there's no faults that are kicking up, any kind of discrepancies that are within the logbook we have to address. Overall, it went successfully, no problems at all. We got the aircraft dispatched on time, so I was happy about that. On to the next one. Let's go. Round two. Let's go. On to the big boys. This one just came up from the hangar, but it's got to do the uh, final ETOP check on this one. And this one will be heading out to Heathrow. Do a quick little walk around. Little GE90 love. I'm sure at this point you're pretty much tired of hearing the word ETOPS, but it's a daily thing for us. So for us, we see it and do it every single day. So when I mentioned right there, the final. So the ETOPS can be done in two stages. The, you can have the initial stage, but the biggest portion of this is three hours prior to departure. That's the final. It's as almost like doing double the duty. You perform the actions, the same things, and then you do them again right before departure, three hours before departure. That's what I meant. Go check the cargo pits. Woo, it turned out to be a beautiful day today. Look at that. That's gorgeous. I'll stop talking about ETOPS for a second, but let's focus on the cargo door itself. Look how massive this thing is. So pretty interesting on the 777, this, this is the 777 right here. Uh, the cargo door opening system is actually electric. It's electric motors and dra shaft driven right there with a torque tube to drive the motors. Pretty intricate. Now other aircraft utilize different systems. If you take a look at the Airbus family, uh, such as the Airbus 321 family, it's a hydraulic system. It uses hydraulic pumps to drive hydraulic actuators to open doors. I won't bore you with the rest. Enjoy the 340 takeoff I caught. On to the next one. Pilots came in. Sometimes they already know that the airplane stays overnight, so 
they turn it off, but it's all good. There you go. Get you some Christmas trees. I call it the Christmas trees, but what I'm actually doing is a light test. It's to inspect all the illumination, making sure all the light bulbs are working correctly. But I call it the Christmas trees, so because everything lights up. And it just looks pretty. What? What do you want? <laughs> I have fun. But yeah, as you notice, I'm bouncing from airplane to airplane. We're back inside of Airbus right here. So just doing our preliminaries and making sure everything's okay. Is it too early for Christmas music? <laughs> hey, check out what came in. Look at this. This is the one that just freshly got repainted. Very cool. This is the Allegheny bird. Very nice. This used to be actually on a 319. And now it's on a 321. <laughs> oh, hot brakes. Let's see. Oh, man, oh man. Hey, let's cool those down. One of the most common questions I always get is, why does Airbus have brake fans and Boeing doesn't need them? Well, to put this to a simple notion is that Airbus does not need them as well. It's an option. There are plenty of carriers out there that do not have brake fans. The whole point of the brake fan is to cool, obviously to cool the brake, duh, but for faster turnaround times. Let's say aircraft going into very hot station environments. They need to cool those brakes down because they cannot dispatch the aircraft with a hot brake. Otherwise, it's just difference of design. That's just what Airbus offers. Boeing does not. I mean, to each their own. It's all good. Yeah. Otherwise, do the usual. It's always a good habit to print a post-flight report. It gives you a sense of what the airplane is doing overall. I want to look at the status, which is that, normal. It's good. Somebody asked me a little bit ago, I said, Stig, what's this right here in the middle? See these? Well, what these are are actually eyesight alignment balls. So what you do is when you're adjusting your seat, back, forth, up and down, you can do it electrically or manually. What you want to do is you want to align and sit down and align the red ball making sure it's covering the white ball, like that. If it's like this, that means you're in perfect level position where you should be suited, sitting. It's perfectly matched to where you can reach the controls and eyesight. So that's, that's, what, that's basically what that's for. But since we are here, let's ask you a question. Why not? Okay, I've talked about the MCDU before, right? And I've showed you a few functions here and there. But when you take a look at the lettering over here some of the letters actually have boxes around them e n s w that's my question to you tell me why some of these letters from this alphabet have particular boxes around them that's my question to you have fun Let's see if we can figure it out Alrighty, coming up on our last flight also etops yeah <laughs> heck of a lot of etops is coming through today this one is a 777-200. This one actually came up from the hangar, so it's going to be the final. We're not going to walk around. We'll get inside the cargo pits. The huge. There's some Rolls Royce action for you as well. Beauty. One fun thing about working on the airport, you make lots of friends. And most of my friends know I run the social media thing here. And I capture a lot of things and they like to capture me. Walking around like a doofus pointing my camera and my phone and talking to myself. Yes, I am a crazy person. Thank you. <laughs> Behind the scenes, have fun. Cheers. Welcome to Starship Enterprise. <laughs> How cool is that? 
I love sci-fi and I'm definitely a Trekkie. Uh, I like Star Trek more than I like Star Wars. I like Star Wars too, don't get me wrong, but I'm more of a Star Trek guy. Definitely next generation. We're doing a final aircraft here and just walking through and making sure everything's okay. Luckily, no discrepancies, no problems. Aircraft got dispatched perfectly. Very happy about it. Some days are exciting, some days are not so exciting. But the thing about it is fun. Luck would have it, it started raining right at the end of my shift. I hope you guys all enjoyed this. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate you all. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.